Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. An arresting development in the mayor's race, in the governor's race, differing views on education funding, and what difference will gender make in the Johnson County elections? Plus, of course, roast and toast. But we start with our interview segment and put the focus on three questions that will appear on the Missouri ballot this November. All three deal with making medical marijuana legal. Two are constitutional amendments, one's a proposition. What are the differences, if any? We'll get some thoughts from Jack Cardetti with New Approach Missouri. Jack, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Got to be confusing for voters when they go to the polls on November the 6th and see three questions all dealing with the same issue, medical marijuana and making it legal. Can you simplify this for us and tell us what the essential differences are? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it really is, is incredible. Uh, you know, the debate this year isn't so much whether or not Missouri will become the 31st state to have medical marijuana, but under which system they'll do it. And there's three different propositions. Now, Amendment 2, which is what we support, uh, would, is a fairly straightforward approach. It would have the Missouri Department of Health regulate the program, and there'd be a small 4% sales tax that would go towards veterans' issues. Now, Prop C, which would be trumped if either of the constitutional amendments pass, that's another fairly straightforward approach. Uh, the biggest difference there is if it passes, the legislature could come back and, uh, and, and void it yeah. or, or change it. Amendment 3 is really sort of the outlier there. It is a much different approach to medical marijuana. It's backed by a single person, a, a personal injury attorney. Brad Bradshaw. Brad Bradshaw. We know of Brad. He's <laughs> run for office before. Yeah, and if you've seen uh, his billboards for, pers for his personal injury firm here in Kansas City, you're familiar with him. He would essentially put himself in charge of the program. He'd be a chair of a new you know, state agency that would oversee this, appoint the board members, and then he would also place a 15% sales tax on the sale of medical marijuana, which would be the largest just in the nation. Okay, let's say Amendment 2, the one you support, passes. What happens then? Yeah, absolutely. And so Missouri will join 30 other states where a state licensed physician, an MD or DO, can work with a patient that had cancer, epilepsy, PTSD, or other debilitating uh, issues, look at their, uh, their, their uh, different disease or illness and say, okay, we believe medical, mar medical marijuana is an appropriate treatment option. Will there be companies that spring up providing medical marijuana? So, yeah, all of that will be through the Missouri Department of Health. An existing state agency will license this. All of it has to be produced in the state. We have to be sold at a dis licensed dispensary. All of that will be highly regulated by the Missouri Department of Health. Do we know that medical marijuana actually helps cure any diseases? Yeah, we know that medical marijuana has some real benefits. Uh, when you look at cancer, someone that has nausea, somebody that, that it helps with appetite, it helps with sleep, so it really can bring a lot of relief uh, to patients. But even more, uh, the, the other thing that really helps is when you look at what it does to opioid abuse. Uh, doesn't it do a lot for pain relief if you're in severe pain, medical marijuana helps even? ease that pain? Yeah, severe pain, chronic pain is one of the best things that medical marijuana is for. And the thing is, right now, physicians, when someone's in uh, pain, their real only option is to prescribe opioids. And we know that opioids have some level of addiction that go with them. And so what the Journal of American Medicine has found <coughs> in, in a study just out this May is when states implement a medical marijuana law, uh, opioid prescriptions actually go down. We think that that's good for you society. You mentioned there are 30-some states that have legalized medical marijuana. The federal government has not legalized it. That is, you're How absolutely right. How does that happen? Right. You're absolutely right. The, the, like a lot of things, <laughs> D.C. has not gotten with the times. D.C. has not led on this issue. As a result, the states have picked it up. If you look at just this summer, the state of Oklahoma, medical marijuana was on the ballot. It passed there. In the 2016 election cycle, it was on the ballot in those liberal bastions of North Dakota, Arkansas, and Florida, where it needed 60% of the vote. It passed in all of them. Jack, you're known throughout Missouri as a Democratic consultant, a very successful one, I might add. Uh, is this a measure that is backed by Democrats exclusively and by liberals? Uh, 
Uh, absolutely not. In fact, there's a bipartisan coalition of veterans and patients and doctors that back this. And for a little proof of that, look no further than the Joplin Globe. In the most conservative part of the state, they came out and endorsed Amendment 2 just this week. In fact, some of our most fervent supporters here are very libertarians. They're Trump supporters that don't believe that the government ought to be coming between a doctor and a patient. I, I think I saw in one of the documents about your organization that you have the ACLU on the left, essentially, and the Tea Party on the right, both in support of Amendment 2 and medical marijuana. Absolutely. They're both sticking up for patients here. We love that, that coalition. When I leave the show today, we'll actually go uh, to announce that the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, that don't get involved in many political issues, are coming out in support of Amendment Jack, 2. Jack, pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks Appreciate for having time. me. You bet. That is Jack Cardetti with New Approach Missouri. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Jeremy LeFevre is a former Missouri state representative, now with LeFevre and Associates. Dave Traubert is the president of the Kansas Policy Institute. Michelle Watley is founder of the Griot Group. And attorney Steve Marakian is with the law firm of Warsh, Hobbs & Marakian and is co-chair of the 2020 Avenatti for President Committee. Congratulations, Steve, He's on doing that. extremely well. You, Pays off that $4 million. He's going to be in great shape. You attorneys stick together, no question about it. <laughs> Becoming mayor of Kansas City is no doubt an intoxicating thought, but intoxication en route can be a problem. Third District Councilman Quentin Lucas, a KU law professor, was arrested last week in Lawrence on suspicion of DUI. Lucas says he attended a charity event, had too many drinks, decided he best not drive back to Kansas City, sat in his car and went to sleep. Responding to a call, Lawrence police found Lucas, arrested him, took the councilman to jail. Lucas says he never drove, never even started his car, and acted in a responsible manner. So regardless of what happens now, whether he pays a fine or is exonerated, what will be the impact on his race for mayor, Jeremy? Will this hurt, help, or have little to no effect at all? Well, and I've always sort of been along the lines that when you get in trouble like that, you've either got to be a criminal defendant or you've got to be a politician, and it's really tough to be both. Uh, no matter how it comes out, having a, a mug shot on a mailer is never a good thing. Um, but I think it's certainly possible. Um, you know, people really like a repentant uh, a sinner, so to speak, or they, they like an apologist or somebody who takes responsibility for their actions. I think there's still plenty of opportunity potentially for, for the councilman to uh, get ahead of this at some point. I, I also understand, you know, his desire to probably uh, want to see this through the criminal proceedings if, if it does go forward. I certainly think that whatever happens in that regard certainly will dictate to some extent the, the outcome of this too. Michelle, the election, the primary is not until April of 2019. Does he have enough time to get this forgotten by voters? He definitely has enough time. The primary is, you know, ages away, and at this point, we're in the throes of uh, a heated midterm election. We've got 12 days, what is it, 34 minutes, 54 seconds, you know, before we have midterms, and we've got two of the most contested races in the nation, both in Kansas and Missouri. So I think it gets lost in a sea of ads um, in the midterm, and then he has plenty of time. But do you think his opponents may use that against him, remind people of the charges? I think they do. So uh, the councilman's handling of the situation is becomes more more important than the situation itself. Does he apologize? You know, he, come, he came out uh, ahead of it. He was very transparent about the situation. And so that is all, that's what's going to play out with voters. Dave, does it surprise you that you can be charged with DUI in Kansas without even driving the car, just sitting in the car? Well, considering that people can have their personal property seized for no good reason uh, under civil asset forfeiture laws, no. It, I mean, anything doesn't surprise me. I think that uh, this issue really underscores the need for criminal justice reform in Kansas. I mean, for someone to be able to make a responsible decision to not start, even start their car, assuming he's representing the facts accurately, I mean, that's, that should not be punished. Uh, if, if, they didn't, if he didn't drive, uh, then he shouldn't be punished. Do you represent people charged with DUI who never started their car? We have. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I have always believed and still believe that under our Constitution, you're presumed innocent. And the fact of the matter is, the state would have to prove that he was operating that vehicle. There's no crime of sitting in a car, even though you may be intoxicated. I take him <coughs> at his word. I have no reason not to at this point. 
So if he wants to come out later on and say, well, I made it up and, or whatever and I apologize, fine. It's not going to hurt him in the campaign at all. I agree with what's been said. This is, this is minor, minor stuff. Even if he were convicted of a DUI, people tend to forget those kinds of things. They want to focus on, his, on the policy plans and things of that nature. But it does strike me as being a kind of a, the way our society seems to be changing, that when someone is accused of something and they're in a high-level position, we suddenly all want to believe they must be guilty because they were accused. I have no reason at all to doubt what he said. And if what he said is true, he acted in an extremely responsible fashion. All of this notwithstanding, is Lucas a strong candidate for mayor? I think he was a strong candidate then. I think it's possible that he's still a strong candidate. He's a charismatic guy. Absolutely. He's, just, he's an intelligent individual. I think you know, in a crowded field, uh, how does something like this impact that primary race? And then if he manages to squeak out into the top two, uh, how does that impact? Uh, you know, whether I, there's, there's the criminal side of this, innocent until proven guilty, certainly. And then there's the, the public side of this. And I think it remains to be seen how the public will react. Dave, you to think voters like might commiserate with uh, Lucas and say, you know, he's done everything he can do. He didn't drive his car. He's apologized. He's paid his fine or went to jail, whatever happens to him. And, and will have some empathy and sympathy for him? I think that's certainly possible, Mike. Uh, I, I imagine uh, some people can identify with making, as he says, making a responsible decision to not even start his car. Uh, I, I think that, uh, in, in fact, some, I, I agree that some people will probably use that against him. Uh, that could actually backfire on, on people using it if, if the facts are borne out that, that he acted responsibly. Certainly brought his name to the attention of Kansas City voters, <laughs> it did, which it, might be valuable. It did in an unfortunate, you know, way. As you look at a crowded field, this could be for yeah. some voters a way that they weed out who they, you know, who becomes a front runner of their mind. But again, the, the primary. All right, Michelle, who else is getting time. attention in the mayor's race? Jolie Justice. Jolie Justice for jumping back in the race after having jumped back out, and, I, it, and again, I think we're pretty far out. Um, so to be pretty hard to tell how that impacts voters, but it's not something that I think they forget. Um, it'd be interesting to see how voters view that. Um, she was the front runner when she was in before uh, Jason Kanner jumped in, and so to see her jump out and jump back in, it'd be interesting to see how that plays Steve, out. Steve, I wish you had been here last week when I was talking about Julie Justice, that she had dropped out and then got back in, and I said, justice delayed is not <laughs> justice denied. <laughs> Well, See, nobody that? laughed last week. They just went like, yeah, uh, what's the yeah, point? What are you trying to say? She should use that in her campaign. That's yeah. right. All right. There are no doubt many policy differences and preferences between the two major candidates for Kansas governor, Democrat Laura Kelly and Republican Chris Kobach. One both like talking about is funding K-12 education. Senator Kelly is proposing no changes to the present system, where lawsuits from four districts, including Kansas City, Kansas, often result in the state Supreme Court deciding the amount and fairness of state funding. Secretary of State Kobach supports a constitutional <laughs> amendment, which, if approved by voters, would give the final decision on school funding to legislators, not the state Supreme Court. The Kansas Policy Institute, of which Dave is president, recently released a lengthy study about Kansas school finance. And Dave, what are a couple of the key findings in that study? Steve, I'll give you five key Mike, points to remember. Mike, Mike, Mike. I'm sorry. <laughs> Steve over there. Steve's over uh, there. I'll give you five key points to remember. You enjoying your last appearance on the <laughs> it's, it's been fun, Mike. It has been fun. Um, Number one, uh, school funding uh, last year set yet another record at $13,600 per pupil. Number two, uh, funding has not been cut as many people have claimed. It's actually increased six of the last seven years, and <coughs> most of those years were record-setting years. Number three, no amount of money is going to resolve the real education crisis in Kansas, and that's persistently low student achievement. I'll give you some examples. Only 37% of students are proficient in reading. We've seen billions more added over the last 20 years, far above inflationary levels, uh, and we still have, uh, we have a lower ACT score than we did 20 years ago. We have less than 30% of kids college ready on, on, in English reading and math and science on that. If you look at the, uh, the constitutional issue, in 1994, the Kansas Supreme Court said the constitutional language is not about setting a certain funding level, but about creating a system, kind of having a formula 
And, and the last one is that the cost study that was done, uh, paid for by the legislature, is worthless. You're saying this sufficient provision aspect of the Constitution does not apply to finances? According to the 1994 Kansas Supreme Court, they said that that language is about creating a system of funding, not setting an amount. Now, very quickly, because i got to get other people in here, but you're saying there's more money for Kansas schools than schools are using, and everything I read says just the opposite, that Brownback has taken money away during his tenure as governor, and schools don't get nearly enough money. Yeah, unfortunately, there are people who claim that, including uh, not this program, but a lot of people in media claim that. Right. Uh, and it's just not true. Funding, according to the Department of Education, funding is not only at record levels, but so are the cash reserves, the carryover money, uh, which indicates they haven't spent all the money they received and, in the and past year. KCK, Kansas City, Kansas, is one of the districts with carryover money that's not being used. Uh, they're one of the worst according. examples. All right. Michelle, can, can this take place and keep the courts from deciding controversies? It'll be interesting if that takes place, but the, the role of the court is to be the neutral party in decisions like this or other controversies um, so that partisan politics and other issues don't come at play. And so I think that's the value that the Supreme Court has in being a deciding factor in something like this. So the notion that um, we want to take that away from the courts, it's, it's Well, well Jeremy, what me. happens to these four school districts that depend on the state Supreme Court to increase funding every time they fail, file suit? These are districts that say they are poor, have less affluent people in the district. Well, I, I, there is a, 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 the two provisions of the Kansas Constitution about equitable and sufficient, and there is a requirement that, that all students receive a sufficient education. I think education. that's part of a Supreme Court finding rather than the Constitution. That's right. That's not in the Constitution. Yeah. I, I think Supreme Court just ruled that it was inadequate and not equitable, and that's what they're trying that's to remedy. A, yeah. I, I, I think... I'm right. We can we yeah. can we can <laughs> split the baby on, on the words Trust on that one, but uh, the the idea is that the education, the financing level, must meet certain uh, standards to be able to provide for an adequate education. Can we bypass courts, Steve, like this constitutional amendment would? Absolutely, and let me address two things that that uh, that were just talked about, and and I would do respect. It's not a matter of just <clears throat> splitting the baby on the words. Okay. The words are what matter. The Supreme Court of Kansas, like every Supreme Court, like every court, is supposed to be neutral. But that's not the question. The question is, what is the role of a court under our Constitution? It is not the role of a court to legislate. It's just that simple. So we Which have to look at whether legislation we have to is look, constitutional. That's, that's true. But we have to look at the <clears throat> words of the Constitution not the words the court has chosen to use, it is the Constitution that governs. The words of our Constitution, when it becomes obvious to the people of a state that a court seems to be legislating, that it is the prerogative of the people, if they choose to do so, to amend the Constitution in a way that would not deprive the court of its job, but would simply say, we have now changed the Constitution so that you can no longer usurp the power of the legislature. Okay, got to stop it there and mention that this is not on the ballot and, and may not be for some time. If and if ever. it were, it would fail. And it depends not on... Not according to polling. No, I disagree. The polling that you have is... I mean, it's it's 600 people. 500 of them are, are registered voters. Of those, probably 40% are likely voters. So only one-third of your polls respondents are actual people who would go to the polls. That well, constitutional two, amendment would get trounced. Two-thirds are Dave's <laughs> friends, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta move From what one reads and hears about Johnson County, it is easy to assume that most residents like the way the county commission does business. Residents often cite good infrastructure, quality schools, competent law enforcement, and manageable tax rates. But the president of the Johnson County Democratic Women's North chapter, talking about the Johnson County Commission, says, it is not acceptable that it's all white male. That's not our county. That's not who we are. Four of the commission's seven seats are on the ballot, all four held by male incumbents. There's a female challenger in each of the four races. Let's start with this. Does gender should gender play a role in deciding who Johnson Countyans vote for? Steve, you are a Johnson Countyan. Well, it's the way you've asked the question, it can be answered either way. 
Well, that's people, the idea. People, people obviously have the right to decide if they would choose, if they would rather vote for <clears throat> uh, a female or a male. Gender can certainly be play a role because you may say, I would choose, I would like to support a female candidate. But the question, as I see, the larger question is whether or not within our society we, we do ourselves a service by, by looking at people and evaluating their ability to serve as elected, polit as elected uh, representatives and so forth based upon uh, essentially immutable factors such as race or sex or age. Okay? It seems to me if the, if the, if the chairman of the, of the Johnson County Democratic uh, Women's Group or whatever she is wants to say we'd like to see more women on the commission and more women should run and more women should try to be on, I agree with that 100 percent. That's fine. But the notion that there's something inherently evil or wrong about having white men on the commission as opposed to white women or black women or Hispanic women or I, I don't care. The fact of the matter is, vote for people who are qualified without saying you're qualified because you are a man. Let me get to Michelle. Uh, let me get yeah. to Michelle now with the same question. Essentially, uh, what role should gender play, if any, in choosing who you vote for? Does gender play a role? Yes, in this era of Me Too, the Women's March, and more women running for office at any time in recent history, it does play a role. Should it play a role? Of course, we want to elect candidates who are best suited and qualified to uh, run for office. And in this case, some of those candidates happen to be women, but I don't think that what the argument she's making is that it is wrong for you to be white and male. Um, however, to have a commission that has, you know, seven, is it seven or nine members mm -hmm. that are all older white males uh, for the last, almost the last decade, that's problematic. Well, uh, but of course, they didn't elect no. themselves. Of right. course, they didn't, but, you know, it's not representative. Again, this is a role. Candidates are run to represent the electorates that vote for them, and seven white men on a, a commission is not reflective of the demographics of Johnson County. Well, Jeremy, we are seeing a lot of women run across yeah. the nation, uh, especially for the U.S. House and Senate, I believe. Yeah, I think the voters of Johnson right. County are going to get the, the best say <coughs> to your question of right. whether their uh, diversity among governing bodies is important to them. And I think uh, diversity of gender and diversity of race and diversity of thought and socioeconomic status Status, but in this case, I think uh, diversity of gender is an important topic, and the, the voters in Johnson County are about to, I think, tell you that it is important. Dave, you live in Johnson County, I mm -hmm. believe. Uh, I do. do you have a generally positive view of the way the county commission has been operating? You know, I think that there is a, a need for some change in overall in how the commission has been operating, <coughs> but it's based on policy, not old, young, male, female. It's I'll give you an example. Property taxes in Johnson County have increased 226 percent over the last 20 years, while inflation and population were only about 88 percent. There was a, a survey uh, a few years ago where the county residents said they did not support property tax increases, and yet the commissioners uh, went ahead and did it. So the issues should be about the, the, the role of government and how people view the issues not what color they are or what gender they are. All right, we got to head now for the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to imply, deny, or defy. <laughs> and we start with Mr. Ruckhead. <clears throat> A president has put it into perspective the absurdity of the notion that the United States should allow 10,000 migrants to cross our border under the Honduran flag by saying, if you want to come here and remain here, you must do so lawfully. We must secure our borders and cannot permit people to enter or stay unlawfully. Of course, the president who said that, the very insightful words, was Barack Obama in 2005 when he was a senator. So I guess in the eyes of the open borders lunatic, Barack Obama now joins Bill Clinton and Donald Trump as racist, xenophobic, crazy old white guys. Jeremy? I have a roast today for the deranged psychopath that is somehow... Uh, committing acts of terrorism in our country as well as the politicians that apologize for and coddle them. Uh, it's enough, it's time to stop, and it's time for us to lead our country into the nation, excuse me, the nation that's safe for my daughters to grow up in. Michelle? 
I want to give a toast to the women running for Johnson County Commission um, and stepping up and, and taking leadership. No offense to the uh, old white or male guys on this panel. No or, uh, no, not, you know, and others. Speak for yourself. <laughs> she just called you old. <laughs> Any of you that call me old. No offense to those that may apply, but it's great to see women stepping up, um, both as women who bring a different perspective um, and added value to the commission, but who are also just as duly qualified to run for office and take those seats. Dave. Thank you, Mike. Um, <laughs> a, uh, a roast for the Kansas City Star um, for uh, unbelievably using a series of false accusations to uh, ironically accuse a gubernatorial candidate of lying about school finance. And then, having been presented with proof that their claims were false over a week ago, they've still to, they've yet to, to retract that and correct the record. So, look, look, we know that the Kansas City Star uh, prefers the big government tax and spend candidates, but even editorial writers should be honest and accurate. And finally, here's a toast to U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, who may have stumbled over the boundaries of political correctness when she said this at the Al Smith dinner in New York. Actually, when the president found out that I was Indian American, he asked me if I was from the same tribe as Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> Haley's speech was well received, and some analysts see her as a future GOP presidential nominee. And that is Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night. Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings. The Hartwig Family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you.